Okay, we're, we are we're now, in the green room, right? We are now broadcasting. So oh, we are now live. People are starting to filter in um, and we will be getting started in a few moments. Yeah, a few moments. So welcome everyone to uh, the town hall meeting. If you're just filtering in, we're gonna be starting uh, right at four o'clock. So in a few more minutes, um, but we're here and uh, we'll be starting very soon. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Morgan Ineson, and I'm the Manager of Education and Research at Fighting Blindness Canada. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our first uh, town hall uh, meeting. The purpose of these calls is to highlight the latest developments here at Fighting Blindness Canada, and to provide updates on our progress towards our mission, to lead the fight against blindness by raising and directing funds to accelerate the development and availability of treatments and cures. On today's call, our president and CEO, Doug Earle, will provide a strategic update and financial review. Ann Morrison, Director of Philanthropy, will give an update on our fundraising programs. Dr. Larissa Moniz, Director of Research and Mission Programs, will share an update on research in this challenging COVID-19 world and highlight our mission activities. And finally, Dr. Chad Andrews, our Senior Advisor, Policy, Equity, and Access, will speak on our public initiatives. 
so sorry, I just had some interference there. So uh, there will be a time uh, at the end for questions. There are a few ways you can ask a question. You can type them at any time during the uh, webinar in the Q&A window, which uh, the button for this is on the bottom bar of your screen. Um, in the, in, during the question and answer period, there is also a way to raise your hand, and I'll explain how to do that uh, when we get to that point. Um, so don't worry, even if we don't get to all of your questions today, we will answer the questions and share them along with the recording and the script of this call that will be posted on our virtual events page on the Fighting Blindness Canada website. Um, so I do ask that, I know there is a chat window, um, but if you can refrain from using that during the call, uh, as it does, um, it is disruptive for people who are using screen reading software. But if you have a question, please either hold it till the question and answer period, or you can always type it into the Q&A box. Uh, lastly, a recording of this town hall will be available and a fully accessible transcript uh, will be available on our website in the weeks ahead. So I would now like to turn it over uh, to our president and CEO, Doug Earl. Thank you. Welcome everyone. And thank you. Uh, I just, there we go, Morgan. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Morgan. Uh, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us at this first town hall meeting for supporters of Fighting Blindness Canada. Welcome. Uh, on behalf of our volunteer board of directors, our staff, and the volunteers at Fighting Blindness Canada, we hope that you are remaining safe and keeping well during this COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to share my personal thoughts and prayers to the families impacted by the rampage in Nova Scotia this weekend. We have many challenges facing our country at this time that only by working together will we overcome them and emerge stronger afterwards. I'd like to be, start today by recognizing the countless volunteers at Fighting Blindness Canada during this Canada's National Volunteer Week. Without your dedication and commitment of time, Fighting Blindness Canada could not achieve our mission, uh, and especially in these challenging times. Thank you for your commitment. Yes, these are challenging times for everyone as we work together to flatten the curve and stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus. For Fighting Blindness Canada, the safety of our supporters, our volunteers and staff is at the foremost priority for us. For this reason, our office has been closed for over the last, for over a month now. Our staff are working remotely. We've canceled our in-person meetings and events until the end of June. And we're trying new ways to offer our, our activities virtually and connect with our supporters like today's town hall meeting. We are monitoring what the summer and fall calendar will look like, whether or not we can start our events and, and our in-person fundraising again. COVID-19 is impacting Fighting Blindness Canada's fundraising revenue. For example, in March 2019, we raised $264,000. Compared to this past month, in March 2020, we raised 173,000. This represents a 34% drop in our revenue. Ann Morrison will speak more about our fundraising efforts to fund our mission shortly. But these revenue challenges are serious for an organization, especially because our mission to, to fight blindness continues despite COVID-19. Let me share three ways our mission is making a difference right now. First, Vision research is continuing, but it is continuing under a new reality of COVID-19. Our researchers have advised us that for some, their research is slowing down. For many researchers, they have advised that their experiments are underway, that got started before the COVID emergency, are continuing, but in this new reality. For some other researchers, they've advised their institutions are not allowing new experiments to start. And others who require person-to-person -person interviews, this research has not started. Therefore, research work over the last few weeks has focused on data analysis and research design remotely from their labs. Larissa Marnez will update us on the activities of our researchers shortly. Second, our health information line is receiving calls about COVID-19 and your eye health. 
we have developed answers to frequently asked questions that we have received in order to help people living with vision loss. And we've posted them on our website, fightingblindness.ca. For example, we are receiving questions like, how do I take my daily eye drops for glaucoma? Or what does it mean to the stabilization of my vision if my next anti-VEGF injection for age-related macular degeneration or diabetes-related vision complications was postponed? These anti-VEGF medications are critical to avoid blindness for thousands of Canadians. And today, for many, these appointments have not happened in the past month. And there is uncertainty when the treatments will start again, especially given that this age group puts them at high risk for COVID-19. And when we have been receiving, and recently we've been receiving questions related to mental health. Therefore, we've developed a series of answers to these questions and posted them on our website to help people living with blindness stay mentally well during these challenging days. Third, the government asked in March, right in the middle of the pandemic, asked Fighting Blindness to provide patient input into the first sight restoring treatment for an inherited retinal disease. This treatment is currently under review by Health Canada. They have given us a very short deadline of May 15th to provide our input into their decision. Chad Andrews will discuss shortly how we are working with our vision partners to provide the strongest voice possible into the government's decision whether to recommend or not recommend this new treatment called Luxterna to be publicly funded by our provincial drug benefit programs. Luxterna is a gene therapy that improves the sight for individuals with Leber congenital amorosa and a specific type of retinitis pigmentosa. Over 90% of the people that participated in the clinical trials for this treatment had improved night vision and gained other visual improvements after the treatment. Lixterna is not a cure, but it can restore significant sight for people living with the targeted gene mutation in the RPE65 gene. Lixterna is an exciting example of our research mission delivering new innovative treatments that restores sight. The decision on Luxterna will set the precedent for the future innovative gene and cell therapies. So May 15th is a critical milestone for all Canadians being able to access future treatments. Fighting Blindness Canada plays a critical role to end blindness caused by blinding eye diseases. We are the catalyst in funding breakthrough research and innovation, innovative science that provides solutions to prevent blindness new site restoring or stabilizing treatments, and ultimately the cures. 46 years ago, Fighting Blindness Canada was formed by families with a loved one who had a diagnosis of a blinding eye disease. Back then, we didn't understand the biology of why their loved ones were going blind. We didn't understand the role that DNA played, and there were no treatments. Today, I am pleased to say times have changed thanks to supporters of Fighting Blindness Canada. Research delivered anti-VEGF treatments for Canadians living with age-related macular degeneration or diabetes-related vision complications became available in 2006. And we've had several glaucoma treatments that can delay the vision complications caused by glaucoma for many. And now Lixterna the first research-delivered treatment for an inherited retinal disease is being considered by Health Canada. Times have changed and for the better. Thank you for your continuing support to make all of this happen. Our work must continue. Our work is critically needed. Our work is not done. In 2006, half a million Canadians were living with blindness. In 2017, it was over a half, one and a half million. That's three times more people living with a seeing disability in just one decade. And I note here that I'm talking about Canadians who are living with blindness. In addition, there is the number of people who are at risk of going blind. These people are living with eye conditions that put them at serious risk of losing their sight. And this number is over five and a half million Canadians. 
combined, that is 7 million Canadians. This in a nation whose entire population is only six times that number. Or think of it this way, double the number of people living in the city of Vancouver today, and that is the same number of people living with blindness. And then think about the number of people living in the greater Toronto area. That's the same number that is at risk of losing their sight. Vision loss has the highest direct cost, healthcare costs of any disease category in the country, higher than diabetes, cancer, heart disease, arthritis, and mental illness. Living with vision loss means you, you face twice the risk of falls, four times the risk of hip fractures or broken bones, three times the risk of depression, a greater risk of auto accidents and more medication errors. Seniors with vision loss are admitted to nursing homes three times or three years before those with vision loss and with the obvious loss of independence, loneliness and rising personal cost. The number of people living with blindness will double in a generation by 2031 and the cost of vision healthcare will double to over 30 billion in 2031 if we don't stop avoidable blindness. This is why Fighting Blindness mission is so critical right now. Thank you for your continuing support of Fighting Blindness Canada because research promises to change these facts. There is hope to fight blindness. Your support of Fighting, fighting Blindness Canada is critical to us making investments in research that are transforming people's vision today and holds the promise to give treatment options to more people tomorrow in order that we can restore their, that they could restore their sight if they so choose. To conclude my update, I'd like to share a mission moment. For me, an inspirational story that gets to the heart of our mission. A year ago, I met a young man of 22, Jack McCormick. Jack has been losing his sight since he was born. Jack shared his story with me of the challenges that he faced in getting a diagnosis. About It took, in fact, over a decade to figure out why he was losing his sight. Jack was 15 before he had a genetic test and found out that his RPE65 gene was not working properly. Jack McCormick co-led our Young Leaders Program sharing his experiences and mentoring other youth on how to overcome the stigma of blindness and find meaningful work. Jack graduated from Wilfrid Laurier University in business about a year and a half ago, and today works in human resources at the Oakville Hospital. As a member of Fighting Blindness Canada's patient registry, Jack has been updated on the research that led to Luxterna. And fast forward, if our work is successful in securing public funding for Luxterna, Jack will have the opportunity to be considered for treatment to restore his vision without an economic barrier to access this treatment. This is a story in which many elements of our mission come together. A passionate volunteer, our patient registry and genetic testing at work, and now our public policy initiatives to ensure a treatment that research has discovered is available to Canadians to restore their sight. Fighting Blindness Canada is fulfilling its mission in a powerful, comprehensive way for many people in this country. Every event participant, every donor, every volunteer, every person who inquires about genetic testing or registers in our patient registry, and everyone who participates in our education programs and public policy initiatives is critical to our mission. Success stories are happening thanks to all of you and the advancement of our mission. It's why we have advanced from being a foundation to a fighter, Fighting Blindness Canada. I now would like to turn it over to Ann Morrison, our Director of Philanthropy, so she can provide a review of our various fundraising initiatives that we have underway to support our mission. Anne? Thanks, Doug. Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know me, I have been a volunteer and then an employee of Fighting Blindness Canada for the last 21 years. I originally got involved as a volunteer when my son was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa at the age of five. 
I feel so privileged to work and fundraise for Fighting Blindness Canada and to have played a small part in helping our supporters raise and direct for over $40 million for sight-saving research into blinding eye diseases. Last year, our board of directors developed a five-year strategic plan to accelerate research into treatments and cures for all blinding eye diseases. How will we realize this plan? Well, the bottom line is we must find new ways to raise more money for vision research. Doug mentioned that over 7 million Canadians are either living with an eye disease or have a family member with an eye disease or are at risk of developing an eye disease. This is a staggering number. Families and individuals often feel alone when they receive their diagnoses. But once they learn about Fighting Blindness Canada, they become part of a much larger and stronger community. We all know their strength in numbers. So if everyone touched by blindness and eye diseases come together and takes action in one form or another, we can and we will deliver treatments and cures for blindness. I have been speaking with many of our supporters over the last few weeks um, as we live and adjust to this new reality of staying at home and social distancing. There are some of our friends that have been impacted by the layoffs or they are helping their families cope with a loss of income. We understand that these are challenging times and it may not be the right time for everyone to be thinking about the mission of Fighting Blindness Canada. Their words of encouragement have been heartwarming and much appreciated. I'm also touched by the donors who tell me that they want to support us during these challenging times because we are an organization they care deeply about. They want to do something to make a difference, especially now when there are so many other things they can't control. Last week, I was speaking with a longtime supporter and mentioned that we wouldn't be able to hold our fundraising events this spring and the harsh reality of what this would mean to our finances. I loved his response. He said, you can always count on us to do whatever we can. Our mission to advance sight-saving research is supported in part by the funds raised at our spring fundraising events. Right now, in order to protect our participants and the community, our spring events can't go forward as planned. Sadly, the critical funding from these events to support vision research is in jeopardy. We have delayed our Comic Vision Last Call event to September 17th. And right now is the most important time for securing sponsorship for our October and November Comic Vision events in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. As you can imagine, securing sponsors during a pandemic is trickier than ever. Our Cycle for Sight and Ride for Sight events, usually held in June and the summer months, have always been about bringing people together on a special day to fundraise and raise awareness by either riding a bicycle or a motorcycle. We have come too far in the last 46 years to lose momentum with the critical sight-saving research that our supporters have invested in. The only way to keep going is to keep raising money. So if we can't gather in groups to fundraise, we asked our community, what can we do instead? And they had lots of ideas. First, I'd like to touch on one way that anyone can get involved. Our sightsaver.ca website is a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform that provides our friends an online portal to raise funds for Fighting Blindness Canada. For example, you may wish to create a SightSaver page when celebrating a family birthday or an anniversary or some other milestone where you'd rather your friends make a gift to your, to your favorite cause instead of buying you presents. Or you can create your own special event. In the past, Friends of Fighting Blindness Canada have used the SightSaver program to sell tickets for pub nights, concerts, and other fun events. Now due to social distancing, we need to get even more creative. Perhaps you'll consider holding an online party using Zoom or FaceTime. It could involve music, card games, baking, or whatever you're interested in. When you share your reason for wanting to end blindness and a link to your SightSaver page, your friends, family, and colleagues will very likely make a donation to support you. Whatever your idea, 
The new Sitesaver.ca website will be ready to launch on May 1st during Canada's Vision Health Month, and it will be available throughout the year for you to use. If this has piqued your curiosity, consider putting together a group of four friends or family members and join us on April 24th to participate in our first ever 4 to 4 online fundraising day to fight social distancing online. Your group can get together virtually and host a Zoom cocktail party or dinner party. If you want to find out more, visit sitesaver.ca or email my colleague Susan Techner at info at fightingblindness.ca. Now back to Cycle for Sight. If you're, not a, if you're not familiar with Cycle for Sight, it is known in the community as the perfect one day charity ride. Recreational weekend cyclists, diehard cyclists, tandem cyclists and volunteers have come together for the last 12 years in St. John's, Ottawa, Toronto and Vancouver to fight blindness and raise awareness of eye diseases. This inspiring cycling event is being impacted by the uncertainty of how long we will be required to participate in physical distancing, jeopardizing $650,000 in funds raised nationally for mission critical research and programs that allow us to serve our community. In response, our participants and volunteers suggested we ho host a national virtual online event on June 20th. This means no matter where you live in Canada, you can now participate virtually in Cycle for Sight. This is fantastic because it's, it is a known fact that exercise is a key activity for staying mentally and physically well during this extended period of social distancing. Participating in a new virtual Cycle for Sight is your chance to stay fit and help raise awareness and funds for vision research. Remember, only the event is virtual. The exercise is real. So start your training now. I have. And my Cycle for Sight colleagues are working hard to create an awesome online experience so that on June 20th, when we join together virtually, there'll be special programming for you while you pedal like mad on your exercise bike or your bike trainer, or while you walk up and down the stairs, whatever exercise challenge you set out for yourself. It is gonna be great. So to find out more, please visit cycleforsight.ca. I can't end without touching briefly on our monthly donor program. Monthly giving means people give a little each month to support vision research. This steady and reliable revenue enables Fighting Blindness Canada to plan, uh, to plan our support for researchers, knowing that every month a donation will be received. If you're already a monthly donor, thank you so much. If you'd like to become a monthly donor, please call us at 1-800-461-3331 or you can email info at fightingblindness.ca. If you go to our website, you will see a photo of Jennifer and Stephen Salibri and their son, Nicholas. Nicholas was diagnosed with Usher syndrome and at the age of four years old, he faces a future of deafness and vision loss unless research offers new treatments. There is a clinical trial underway in Canada for one form of Usher syndrome, and Fighting Blindness Canada is also supporting a researcher in Toronto who's working in this area. For these reasons, the celebrity family have hope that research will restore Nicholas's sight. If you're if you're able to give a gift right now, no matter what the size, it would be truly appreciated. Now for an update on fighting blindness research and the mission landscape, I'd like to turn the call over to Dr. Larissa Maniz, our Director of Research and Mission Programs. Over to you, Larissa. Thank you, Anne. Um, I was told that my sound was not very good, so I'm holding the microphone close to my face, and I hope that you can hear me. Um, so to introduce myself, as Anne mentioned, my name is Larissa, and I'm the Director of Research and Mission Programs. I joined Fighting Blindness Canada just over four months ago. 
And I'm happy to be, to be here to give you a snapshot of how far we have come in vision research over the past few years, as well as telling you about some initiatives we have underway to bring new treatments to Canada and to inform and support individuals living with a blinding eye disease. First, I'm just going to see if I can get my, cat, my video back. Um, I think it was stopped. Oh, Morgan, it says the host has stopped it. So if you can um, put it up, but if you can't, that's no problem. Okay. Um, so just like many of us, Doug already mentioned some of the slowdown that has happened in research. But our Fighting Blindness Canada funded researchers are adjusting to the COVID-19 situation. So many of them are working from home and they're only doing essential lab work right now. There we go. The work that's happening will ensure that they don't lose data from experiments that have already been set up and which in some cases may have been years in the making. So it's really important that these are still allowed to go, go ahead while also being really mindful of the restrictions that are in place. Some of our researchers are also clinicians and they are working hard to support their patients and their colleagues in this time. So while research hasn't stopped, it has slowed down. And we do need your help to make sure that once this is over, research can start up again as quickly as possible. Fighting Blindness Canada is predicting an unprecedented drop in our fundraising this year. And if you are in a position to help, we really would appreciate your support more than ever now to ensure that we can continue to invest in this groundbreaking work. At Fighting Blindness Canada, our goal is to drive the development of new sight-saving treatments for blinding eye diseases. I'm very proud to report that thanks to generous supporters, we have funded more than $40 million in vision research. We're delivering an education program for our community and we're having a real impact on public policy to ensure that Canadians have access to new treatments. As Doug mentioned, when Fighting Blindness Canada was founded 46 years ago, we didn't know much about blinding eye diseases. We didn't know what was happening to the cells in the eye to cause vision loss. We didn't have cures or even treatments for many of these diseases. But now if we fast forward to today, we have a much better understanding of the biology of this, these diseases and we do have effective treatments for some of them. So this includes anti-VEGF treatments, which have really changed the landscape for Canadians with age-related macular degeneration and diabetes-related vision complications, such as diabetic macular edema. Glaucoma medications and surgery are also offering ways to stabilize sight for some, some individuals. And for individuals who have an inherited retinal disease, we are finally at the moment when treatments are being tested and even approved. And that's why we're so excited that the first treatment for an inherited retinal disease, Luxterna, might be coming to Canada soon. However, with all of this progress, we know that there's still a lot more work to be done. For example, we know that for inherited retinal diseases, they're actually made up of many different subtypes and they can be caused by mutations in over 300 genes. So for example, for retinitis pigmentosa alone, there are over 60 genes that we know that can cause it. So while Luxterna is offered, it does offer really great hope, it only works in individuals who have the one specific mutation, RPE65. And for some of the other treatments like anti-VEGF or glaucoma and cataract treatments, they have been game changers, but they aren't effective for everyone. And we know that one in four people are still at risk of losing their sight. So thinking back to some of the sobering statistics that Doug talked about, we know that even with all of these treatments available, many Canadians will still lose their eyesight this year. And that's why funding vision research really remains a priority and why Fighting Blindness Canada continues to fund studies across all areas of vision research. This is from the most basic science where we're trying to understand why vision loss occurs to drug discovery and preclinical work but also to supporting clinical trials which are coming to Canada. So I would like to now share actually some of our newest research investments, and I think they really nicely illustrate the breadth of this research. This year, thanks to our donors, we were able to launch six new research grants, and they reflect Canada's vision research community and also our mission. So first off, we have Dr. Walter Michael. He was from the University of Alberta, and his team previously identified a gene that causes pigmentary glaucoma, and this is a form of glaucoma that occurs when pigment particles from the color part of the eye, which is called the iris, are released and they clog the eye's drainage system. So this funding will be used by Dr. Walter to understand more about what the gene does in the cell and how the mutation 
can cause um, increased pressure on glaucoma. We have Dr. Vincent Topepi from the University of Toronto. He is studying the most severe form of Usher syndrome called Usher one and this causes both hearing and vision loss starting in childhood. So Dr. Tropepi has created a new animal model and is actually a type of fish called a zebrafish. And his team will use this to test new treatments, including um, potentially gene therapy for Ush1. We also have Dr. Rod Bremner from the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute, also in Toronto. He's looking for new drugs to treat retinitis pigmentosa. So retinitis pigmentosa is caused when photoreceptors, which are the cells that sense light in the eye when they die. So Dr. Bremner is looking for molecules or proteins in the cell that cause the cell to die, and then we'll try to identify treatments or drugs that can stop the molecules working and hopefully stop the cells dying. We have Dr. Elizabeth Simpson from the University of British Columbia. She is studying a form of congenital blindness called aniridia. And this is where the iris is partially or completely absent. In most cases of aniridia, um, these are caused by mutations in a single gene called PAX6. And Dr. Simpson is testing if gene therapy can be used to put a functional copy of PAX6 back into the eye and improve vision in animal models. And the last two um, grants are Dr. Gregory Borchel and Dr. Susan Leet. So Dr. Gregory Borchel is from the Hospital for Sick Children Research Institute. And he's looking for new treatments for a degenerative disease that's called neurotrophic keratopathy. This happens when the cornea, which is the outer layer of the eye, it loses the ability to feel. And it's because of that, it can lead to injury or scarring and ultimately vision loss. So Dr. Borchel was um, part of a pioneering team that discovered a new type of surgery that can help in some cases treat neurotrophic keratopathy but this grant will help him look for more non-invasive methods. And finally, we have Dr. Susan Leet from the University of Waterloo. She's developing a new vision test for young children. So currently, the current test that we use, it's very hard to diagnose children who are younger than three years old because the tests rely on children being able to um, know the alphabet or to match shapes. But in the new test, children as young as one we'll have to identify the odd one out in a series of symbols or faces, which hopefully will be easier for them to do. And if this works and is shown to be successful, it will be a cost-effective test and will also allow much earlier diagnosis. And finally, on top of those six grants, we have also just announced our newest Clinician Scientist Emerging Leader Award. And this award is really important because it invests in the next generation of ophthalmologist researchers. This award was started to increase the number of clinician researchers because having clinicians who have a research background is really crucial to drive clinical innovation and bring discoveries that are made in the lab um, into the clinic. So Fighting Blindness is funding four young ophthalmologists currently and our newest awardee is Dr. Tianwei Tian Zhou. So Dr. Zhou is currently doing her ophthalmology residency at the University of Montreal and is studying retinopathy of prematurity. And this can cause blindness in preterm babies. And this work is a clinical extension of her previous PhD work. And we're very proud to support her as she embarks on her research career. So talking about all that great research, our supporters are obviously key to being able to fund these projects. And we are so excited about the work that fighting blindness funded researchers and researchers around the world really are doing to drive new treatments. And this is where our next challenge really comes in, making sure that Canadians have access to these treatments once they are here. So in the next session, section, Chad will talk more about how we're working to bring Luxterna to Canada. But another important part of these efforts is fighting blindness Canada's inherited retinal disease patient registry. So this registry is a secure medical database. And what we're asking is for anybody is if you know anybody living with inherited retinal disease, if you are living with an inherited retinal disease, please join the registry and please get your genetic testing done. And by getting these two steps done, we will be able to keep you up to date about new treatments and clinical trials. And as well, it really helps us demonstrate that there is a market to bring new trials to Canada. So in 2019, thanks to our donors, Fighting Blindness Canada was able to play a key role in bringing new trials for inherited retinal diseases to Canada. 
We are currently keeping track of five of these and really hope that there will be more coming soon. So finally, to finish off, I'm going to have a look at some of our other mission programs, which really aim to educate and support Canadians about their eye health. So first of all, we have our health information line. This line is open and we are, as Doug said, very busy answering questions about new treatments and research discoveries, and more recently about the impact of COVID-19 on things like appointments being canceled or the availability of medicines. So if you have any questions about COVID-19, about your eye health, other vision concerns, please reach us at the health information line at 1-888-626-2995, or you can email us at healthinfo at fightingblindness.ca. You can also find information about eye diseases on our website, and we have health education resources here to help you manage and navigate your vision health care. And now, because of COVID, um, as Anne mentioned, we've had to cancel our events, and that includes our in-person Vision Quest events this spring. However, I'm very happy to tell you that we have replaced them with a new virtual education series called Viewpoint that Morgan um, helps manage. So Viewpoint is free of charge. It's a combination of live webinars and pre-recorded sessions, and it covers a range of topics from gene therapy to pharmaceutical treatment, age-related vision loss, and inherited retinal diseases. We held our first session on Thursday with Dr. Natan Chowdhury, who talked about um, how he's managing eye care in the COVID-19 era. And this was followed by a Q&A session. And the session is now available to watch on our website. Our next le live webinar will be on Monday, April 27th at 4 p.m. This is Eastern Standard Time. It was gonna be hosted by two optometrists, Dr. Selena Friesen and Dr. Michael Nelson. And they will talk about some of the most popular low vision devices that are available, and how they can help you maximize your vision. There will also be time to answer questions at the end of the session. And the one after that will be a pre-recorded session on Wednesday, May 6th, also at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This was recorded in 2019, and it is a panel discussion where we brought together scientists, clinicians, and industry experts, and they discussed key research efforts that are underway around the world to develop new sight-saving drugs. So you can watch previous sessions or find out more about our upcoming Viewpoint events by visiting the Get Involved tab at fightingblindness.ca. So please join us in the upcoming weeks um, as we explore cutting edge vision research together. And finally, you can keep in the loop about all of Fighting Blindness Canada's programs by joining our monthly e-newsletter through our website, and I really hope you do. So that was quite a whirlwind overview of all of our mission programs. And so now I'm going to turn this over to Chad Andrews, he is a senior advisor, policy, equity, and access, and he's going to update us on Fighting Blindness Canada's current public policy initiative. That's great. Thanks, Larissa. So um, in some ways, it's great that I get to go last, last here because the, the topic of this session is going to be uh, public policy and some of the interesting work that we're doing in this area. And in many ways, uh, all the information that has been delivered so far provides a very self foundation for this. In fact, uh, the work that we're doing in the policy sphere would not be possible without the incredible work that Anne and her team are doing to raise funds for vision science, and it wouldn't be possible without the incredible work that Larissa and all of our uh, partners in ophthalmology and uh, vision science across Canada are doing to advance treatments. Uh, without those two key ingredients, philanthropy and vision science, uh, there would be no need for public policy initiatives because there would be nothing for us to, to really advocate for uh, or nothing for us to uh, push through the uh, uh, health uh, regulatory system in Canada. So uh, vision policy is really kind of uh, dependent on, on those two things. Um, and absolutely, it is a difficult time right now for everyone. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that it is an exciting time in the world of vision health policy. Thanks to funding from our donors and various partners, we have a robust set of initiatives underway to make sure people living with vision loss have their voices heard by government and policy decision makers. To do this, to elevate these perspectives, we really need to hear from you, the individuals who are affected by vision loss and blindness on a day-to-day -day basis. To collect and synthesize insights, we are asking Canadians living with blinding eye diseases to fill out our new Living with the Vision Loss surveys which are designed to learn more about the physical, psychological, and practical impacts of vision loss. By filling out a survey, you're telling policymakers what it's like to live with vision loss, 
providing a crucial perspective that helps explain why it's so important that new treatments are made available and accessible to all Canadians. We are completing a living with glaucoma study right now for publication. It has received over 300 responses from Canadians living with that disease. And once published, the information will be shared with a broad audience to influence research and public policy development. And I think that it's worth highlighting the glaucoma project um, simply because it, it, it demonstrates the fact that you know, when, we submit, um, uh, when we submit data to the regulatory agency CADF this year for the a review of, of the um, innovative gene therapy Luxterna, it won't be the first time that we've done this kind of work. Uh, so we've been building a very uh, robust public policy portfolio over the last three years with uh, several uh, regulatory agencies in Canada. Uh, so Luxterna is very top of mind. That's the one that's in front of us, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but the glaucoma project also provided us with uh, really helpful perspectives that we were able to put in front of uh, government and uh, uh, major decision makers in health policy as well. In fact, the glaucoma survey is still live if you are eligible. You're eligible if you are living with glaucoma. Um, so if that is the case, we welcome you to fill it out. You can find that survey and all of our other surveys at our website at www.fightingblindness.ca slash news slash 2020 dash FBC dash surveys. And I know that that's a, a mouthful. It, it's also provided on the slide in front of you. Um, but if you didn't get the opportunity to jot that down or don't want to uh, you know, open it up in your browser right now, you can also just go to our website, fightingblindness.ca, and there's a search bar at the top of the site, just like a Google search bar. You can just type surveys into that bar, click enter, and the first um, hit that you'll get is the page with all of our surveys. So that's another way to access our Living with Vision Loss surveys. So I mentioned glaucoma. We have three other surveys that are currently active. Um, one is our Living with an Inherited Retinal Disease Survey. And uh, this is the one that I, I mentioned being top of mind uh, because we will take um, uh, responses to that survey and use them to develop our uh, submission to the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health, uh, who are reviewing Luxterna this year. So this is happening in, in the very near future. Actually, the deadline is May 14 uh, for us to uh, develop a submission. So uh, we haven't closed the survey down yet. In fact, it will, it will continue to, to be open because this is part of a larger research study. Uh, but if you have the opportunity to fill out that particular survey, uh, if you're living with an inherited retinal disease, uh, by all means, please uh, uh, support us in this, this initiative um, by uh, going to our website and, and uh, uh, spending some time with that survey. Uh, if you're not living with an IRD, but you know someone who is, it would also be wonderful if you could just share this information with them and uh, provide them with uh, uh, the link to, uh, to the IRD survey. We also have a living with age-related macular degeneration survey. And uh, finally, uh, we have a living with diabetes-related vision complications survey. So that's a survey for individuals living with either diabetic retinopathy or diabetic macular edema. Later in the year, we hope to launch another survey called IRD Counts, which will provide data to complete a socioeconomic cost of illness report with the help of Deloitte Economics. So all the other surveys that I mentioned, those are quality of life surveys. They attempt to learn more about uh, uh, what it's like to live with these particular diseases. Uh, this other survey, which is uh, you know, happening down the road, uh, will uh, attempt to learn more about the various costs associated uh, with uh, living with an inherited retinal disease. Um, so one thing the government knows for sure is that new treatments for uh, IRDs or, or any diseases really are very expensive. And what we'd be doing with this work is showing them that yes, sure, those are absolutely expensive, but the cost of vision loss is also very expensive. Uh, vision loss puts people out of work. Vision loss puts people into uh, complex circumstances in the healthcare system. And uh, what we'll be able to show is that uh, we can offset those costs enormously by investing in vision science and new treatments. So your responses to any one of these surveys are anonymous and confidential, and you can complete multiple surveys if you have more than one eye condition. The surveys will also remain open for a number of weeks, uh, so you have some time, but like I said, in particular, when it comes to the inherited retinal disease survey, the sooner uh, you can fill that out, the better. Uh, so data uh, from the Living with an Inherited Retinal Disease Survey will be pulled around May 1st 
to be analyzed to provide patient input to the government about whether Luxterna should be publicly funded by our provincial drug benefits programs, which is something that I've covered already. This is a very tangible example of how these surveys impact government decision making. The people, the more people we have completing the surveys, the stronger our case for Luxterna and similar innovative treatments to be approved for public funding. Right now, Luxterna costs 850,000 US dollars if you have the treatment completed in the United States. At Fighting Blindness Canada, we believe economic barriers should not deny someone access to a new treatment to restore sight. These surveys will help us build the case that Canadians need equitable access to safe and effective vision treatments, just like in the UK, where Luxterna is already publicly funded. If you know someone living with these eye conditions, please encourage them to visit fightingblindness.ca or call 1-800-461-3331 to find out more about our surveys and our broader public policy initiatives. The more feedback we collect at the surveys, the greater the impact. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to come back on to video and we can uh, start to answer some questions. Um, <laughs> excuse me. So there's two ways that you can ask a question. Um, you can, at, as I mentioned before, type it into the Q&A box, which is um, a clickable uh, sort of uh, little button on the bottom of your screen, the Q&A. Or um, if this is not accessible to you, you can also ask a question if you're using your computer by raising your hand. So what this does is it notifies me that you have a question and then I can um, sort of open a channel so that you can use your computer audio to ask the question. Um, so I'll let you know, I'll call you by name when that, if your turn, when your turn comes up. So to do that on a PC, you press Alt-Y or on a Mac, you can press option Y. Um, so you can use both of those, those ways to ask a question. Um, we do have a couple questions that were submitted in advance. So we'll start with those and then we'll go to um, the, the Q and A. Um, so the first question I have, I'll address to Larissa. Um, and the question is, how do I find out if I can participate in a clinical trial? So um, that's a very interesting question. So there, it's a few parts to this answer. So I would say the first thing is that in most cases, genetic testing is key. So it sort of depends on what your condition is and what sort of trial it is. But if it's say, an inherited retinal disease, currently most of the trials that are open are for very specific gene mutations. And so it's really important to get your genetic testing done. So if you haven't had your genetic testing done, as I mentioned, please contact our health information line. They can give you more information about what to do or talk to your healthcare provider or your ophthalmologist. So you can contact us at, what is it? 1-888-626-2995 or healthinfo at fightingblindness.ca. But for each clinical trial, there are different parameters that are important. So again, it'd be really, it's really good for you to talk to your healthcare provider who can help you find clinical trials that might be available and tell you which ones you're eligible for, because it often depends on what level of sight you have, potentially um, other things about your health, even things like your age or which part of the country or you might live in. So there's quite a number of different characteristics that will be important before you know if you're eligible for a clinical trial. And each one is different for each clinical trial. Great, thank you, Larissa. Um, so another question that came in in advance, uh, how many fundraising dollars are you expecting to lose because of COVID and how is this going to affect uh, ongoing Fighting Blindness Canada work? Maybe Anne or Doug? I'll be happy. So right now, uh, depending on whether or not we are able to hold our fundraising events uh, in person, uh, in the spring or in the fall, uh, say we're not able to hold any events in 2020, then that, that represents about $1.5 million of revenue uh, that we have to replace in another way uh, because that funding is critical to our ability to fund research grants. Uh, we do not receive any government funding for our research programs. Uh, so we're entirely dependent on donors making a gift. 
And uh, if we're not able to hold those events in person, uh, we are going to try to do it virtually, uh, but, but it will be challenging. Thank you, Doug. Uh, so we have a question in the Q&A uh, from Lewis. Lewis is asking, can a donor direct funds to a particular area of research? I'll field that one. Um, yes, Lewis, um, you can. And, uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that. As you can appreciate, um, because uh, we're not always funding research on on all areas, um, we would have that conversation to discuss um, if there is um, funding, uh, if there are research projects available that would fit uh, your uh, requirements and, uh, and it would also be um, dependent on the amount of your, um, of your gift. So um, I'll ask you to give me a call uh, or um, email me and we can set up a time for a phone call. So uh, I think Morgan will be providing some links at the end of this uh, in an email and she can per perhaps provide all of our email addresses so that people can reach us directly. So thank you for asking that question. Absolutely. Okay, another question um, in the chat and then we'll try to take a hands up question. Um, but for now, uh, Isabel is asking, uh, do we have a Canadian vision or sight day? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, in fact, it's a whole month, uh, and it's uh, May is Vision Health Month in Canada, uh, and we're we're participating in a Why I Care social media campaign, and we're also launching our Sight Saver program uh, to offer opportunity for Canadians to help fundraise for uh, Fighting Blindness Canada. So it is the whole month of May is Vision Health Month in Canada. Great. Okay, so let's try to take a question um, from someone who has their hand up. So, uh, Linda Spinney, uh, I have uh, given you the talking permission. I think you should be able to ask a question now. Um, you may need to unmute your computer. So, if you're using Windows, it's Alt A, or on a Mac, it's Shift Command A. So, give that a try. We'll come back to Linda if we can't get it to work right now. There she is. Oh, there's Linda. Uh, Linda. No, I, I don't have anything to say right now. Oh, okay. Sorry, Sorry about that. That's okay. Not a problem. All right. Let's try another then. We'll try uh, Matt Hunter has his hand up. Um, same thing, I've uh, unmuted you. You can just press uh, Alt A or uh, on a Windows or Mac, uh, Shift Command A to speak. Actually, I didn't even realize I put my hand up. I didn't notice that, but uh, I guess <laughs> one, one question is, uh, does there happen to be any research in the areas of op optic nerve damage? If not, that's okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> I would say yes, there definitely is. Um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you right now. We aren't currently funding. I don't believe anybody who's working on optic nerve damage. Um, if you want more information, feel free to email us and I'm happy to look up some specific um, research that is happening and either send you reviews or um, give you some more information about that. Okay, great. All right, so let's um, go back to the Q&A. Uh, we have a question from uh, Jean-Pierre who's asking, uh, do you have a French online survey and do you still want to hire someone in Dr. Kunakoop's office for helping uh, French people uh, access uh, Fighting Blindness Canada service? Yeah, so let's talk, talk, tackle that one. Um, I can't say anything specifically about hiring someone in Dr. Kunikoop's office to uh, facilitate that kind of work, although it sounds like a, a worthwhile project. Uh, but I can speak specifically to the surveys. And yes, absolutely, we do have French versions of uh, the two major surveys that we have live right now. Uh, so those are the surveys on inherited renal diseases, as well as age-related macular degeneration. Uh, so if that's uh, your preference, is uh, 
France Aid, then uh, you can definitely uh, visit our uh, visit the landing page that I uh, mentioned before, and you can find those surveys in French. Perhaps uh, uh, Morgan can circulate the links to our French uh, surveys and our English surveys in our follow up. Uh, as well, uh, yes, uh, we have uh, funded a position in Dr. Kunikoop's office at the McGill Children's Hospital uh, in order to support uh, bringing clinical trials to Canada and uh, to support uh, our patient registry being available uh, uh, with a new intake site, a new enrollment site uh, for the province of Quebec. A really exciting development and uh, it's been made possible because of donors uh, and the, their gifts to Fighting Blindness Canada that we can expand our patient registry service to the province of Quebec and work with, with Dr. Kunkoop and his colleagues in, the, in Quebec. Okay, great. So now let's try another uh, hand, hand raised uh, question. Uh, so I have uh, Mohammed Aslam. I'm going to um, give you the talking permission now. And again, uh, to unmute, it's Alt A in Windows or Shift Command A on a Mac. Um, I'll give you a second to see if we can hear from you. Okay, I don't know if Mohammed's coming in. Maybe we'll just put that on pause for now. Um, and let's try Judy uh, uh, Pro Prokiuk. Uh, again, you're unmuted now. Uh, you can go ahead and speak. Hello. Oh, there's Mohammed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question, just Morgan. Uh, I have a RP, retinitis pigmentosa, since birth. And uh, it causes uh, gene 65. Uh, it's a heritage disease, so I like to put my name on the register uh, on the for lux thermotherapy or whatever. So just give me some links, uh, the next email or the phone number. I can uh, how I can register my name, and I like to join the all the survey. Great. So I will definitely be sending out an email after um, the webinar, probably tomorrow, and it will include um, links and also to our health information officer who can help you um, sort of navigate and get set up with the registry as well. Yeah, I, I also also uh, like a, like a join any clinical trials, everything, whatever. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, our health information officer can help you um, figure out what might be available. Larissa, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Nope, I think that was perfect. You can um, always look for clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov, but it is a slightly complex website, I know. So I think, Morgan, yeah, please do send that information out and you can contact our health information officer who can help you navigate that. Great, and then we'll try to go back to Judy. Judy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, my question might have been partially answered, answered already by uh, people that uh, we were speaking earlier, but I was asking about, uh, wanting to know about the specific gene and the genetic testing. Like I live in a part of the country where uh, I don't know how, how available genetic testing is. And so how uh, easy is it to do and how does one find out what gene they, uh, that has caused their RP? I'm sorry, I can take that. So, um, in order to get genetic testing done, it is actually covered in all provinces now, which is great news. So you don't have to pay out of pocket. Um, it can take a few months or potentially even up to a year or so sometimes to get to go through the whole process because you would have to be referred from your, um, your healthcare provider, your optometrist, your ophthalmologist, and you would then get um, the name of a genetic counselor who would have to talk to you first before the genetic testing is done. But the whole process is, can sometimes take a little bit of time, but it's not very complicated. So um, again, please Morgan send that information and um, our health information officer has some really help, um, helpful guides for sort of a step-by-step -step how you can get this done, both how you can join the registry, but also how you can get genetic testing done. So hopefully that will be, be useful to you. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so we have some more questions. I realize we're at five o'clock already, um, but maybe we'll take a couple more questions. And then if there's questions that have not been answered, we will 
uh, be sure to answer them. Uh, we'll follow up with you to answer those questions. Um, so I'm just looking to see um, if there's questions about specific maybe conditions, we'll hold on those and respond to you. Um, but Alexis had a question um, who said, I'm sure this has uh, likely been considered. However, what has the discussion been around using online platforms instead of in-person interviews uh, during this time to further research with clinical trials? Um, I can actually answer this because I was talking to somebody, I don't remember who right now, who was saying that they were doing exactly that, where the research was um, uh, interview style. So if they were, say, quality of life, experiential, um, research is definitely being shifted to online where appropriate. It isn't always available or appropriate, though. Um, however, if the, if the in-person meetings were to say draw blood or to look at somebody's eye or to give treatments that of course can't necessarily go on now. So those are the, the research that has been stopped, but you're right. It's, it's a great idea. And I'm sure a lot of researchers have switched into online methods where appropriate. Okay, great. Uh, can, I can I just jump in for a second to add that, um, it could be worthwhile pointing out that the, some of the public policy initiatives that I, that I gestured towards, uh, all of them belong to research projects that we run internally. Uh, so they don't belong in ophthalmology and they're not clinical, uh, but uh, they are legitimate research that has been approved by uh, uh, ethics review board. Um, so they're designed to submit perspectives uh, to government decision makers, but they also end up being developed into manuscripts that are published in peer review journals. Um, so my sort of glasses half full approach to the COVID-19 pandemic is to think of this as a great time to really focus on that work because none of it relies on in-person engagement. Uh, it's survey based and then we follow up with qualitative interviews, but those all take place uh, over uh, this kind of uh, web interface or over phone calls. So um, uh, it's a, a good opportunity in some ways to really, um, you know, bunker down, you know, from my perspective and to, to advance some of these very important projects. Thanks, Chad. So I think we have maybe time for one more and I am looking, I know there's several questions we haven't gotten to, but we will um, follow up with you with answers to these questions. But I think this is a great, uh, really positive uh, way to end. Uh, Malcolm asks, can you share a couple of successes fighting blindness has had as a result of the research we fund? Any takers? Oh, Larissa, I think you're muted. <laughs> okay, there we go, non-muted. I, I couldn't find my picture to talk, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I can talk about a few things. Of course, I, the research has been going on for 40 years and I've been there for four months. So if Doug or Anne wants to jump in after me, please do. Um, so some of the successes that I have seen, just reading some of the progress reports that have come in from our scientists recently. So one of them was from a scientist in Montreal Mike Safaya, who is looking at the impact of the gut microbiome on, on eye diseases such as AMD. And he's found that the, the microbiome, which is the bacteria that lives in your gut, that can sort of tell you how quickly um, AMD might progress. And so it's a possible way that we can have a, a way of seeing if AMD is going to progress to get worse, essentially. Um, and so that's a very exciting and novel way to be looking at progression. Um, another one that we just had, we just had one of our scientists, Philip Monnier, publish a paper about a new protein he's working on, neogenin, and the impact that that has on retinal diseases. So that was published in a journal called Journal of Clinical Investigation, which is very exciting. And we have linked to it in our e-newsletter. So if you want to read more about it, please do go to our e-newsletter. To, to learn more about that already. Um, Doug or Anne, do you wanna jump in as well and maybe give some, some more historical perspective? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to add to, to the, the conversation. I think the, the work that Dr. Kudukup is doing is a prime example of how uh, donations that came in support over the years has led to uh, some am amazing ability today now to have clinical trials in Canada. So we funded the basic science that Dr. Kunukup did in order to discover a number of genes. Some of them are unique to Canada because of our, the way our population had uh, developed. 
uh, but but it was his research with with his colleagues that identified target genes that today uh, we are doing a natural history study on one of those genes. And because of research funded by Fighting Blindness Canada, uh, Dr. Kunukup and his research partner were able to get a very significant grant from the US government's National Institutes of Health. Uh, and so he's leveraged our donor funding, his original discoveries around the basic science into now uh, moving into actual uh, understanding the natural history and uh, very soon we hope uh, turning it into a clinical trial for a, a gene therapy to target that gene. Great, thank you. I just turned my video off for a second there because it seemed a little bit uh, unstable. I wanted to make sure everyone could hear what Doug was saying. Um, so I think we're going to have to wrap it up there because I am mindful of time, but um, I have a record of all of these wonderful questions and we will be sure to reach out to you with, uh, with answers. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're so grateful that you joined to hear about the important work that Fighting Blindness Canada is doing uh, to help change the future of vision care in Canada. Um, as all of our panelists mentioned today, bringing innovative site saving and site restoring treatments to Canada is at the very core of our mission. It's why we do what we do. Uh, research is expensive and it's a long term investment, but the results are life changing. Uh, so if you enjoyed today's town hall, I encourage you uh, to visit our virtual events page on a Fighting Blindness Canada website. Uh, as Larissa mentioned, we have just started our viewpoint series. We've had um, one uh, webinar uh, last week and we have many more to come. Um, so please visit and sign up for any topics that you're interested in. Um, and then this broadcast will also be available on our virtual event page probably tomorrow. Um, so if you want to watch it again or you know anyone who else might be interested, please uh, do share that. Um, on our website, uh, you know, you can also find the information about our internal research that Chad talked about and I will send uh, those links to you in a follow-up email as well. Uh, we would really like to hear from you about your experience. It really helps us uh, with our advocacy and policy work. And lastly, uh, please consider making a donation to help support our site saving research and our mission programs. As Doug mentioned, people are always surprised to learn that we don't receive any funding from the government. All of the work that we do is made possible by the incredible generosity of our donors. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, please visit us online at fightingblindness.ca. You can call us at 1-800-461-3331 or email at info at fightingblindness.ca. Uh, we all hope that you're staying safe and healthy uh, and we'll uh, hope to connect with you at another webinar soon. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Morgan, did you mention the survey? Yes. I'm muted. There is a survey that will pop up when you uh, close the webinar link. We encourage you to fill it out just to give us some feedback uh, because we are new in this virtual space and would love to hear um, what you think of the webinars and what we could do to make them better for you. Um, there will also be a link in the email I send out to everyone. Great. Thanks for the number in. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Bye all. Take care everyone. Yes, yeah, stay Bye. safe. Stay safe. Are we in the green room?